All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so I would usually say I'm Caleb and all that stuff, but uh, two things real quick. Number one, welcome to our guests who are here. One, I have a problem with Caleb because today I'm the second coolest Caleb at River Run, and that's a bummer for me. Um, just kidding. But uh, secondly, uh, Jale, that, that song just um, really pierced my heart, and I feel actually a little bit... Uh, shaky right now, just because I really feel stunned at the reality of God being holy, and that we're here with him, like, he's here with us. That is, if that's true, I mean, (laughs) that is the most important thing about right now, and it is true. Um, So, this morning, uh, a few of us uh, were meeting for prayer at nine this morning, and uh, the, we had a different scripture in mind to kind of start the time of prayer, and um, this isn't planned, so watch the timer. Uh, uh, but the scripture we ended up kind of like Latoya and I just had on our heart this morning, Latoya had on her heart, and then just kind of leaned into it. It was Isaiah 6, and we didn't know about this song today, but Isaiah 6 is the story of Isaiah meeting God and becoming aware of how near he was in God's presence. And so Isaiah has this vision as he's starting to, from here he's going to go out and and carry a message out to the world around him. But in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has this vision. And in this vision, he sees angels called seraphim. And it's crazy, weird image. But listen to this. Um, he sees this vision in Isaiah chapter 6, and then he says, um, I saw these, these angels, and they had these six wings, and it's wild, but they were calling out to each other, and I heard what they were saying about God. And what did they say about God? We read this this morning in prayer and didn't know this song was going to be where we were at. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Like Nate was saying before, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And, and then Isaiah, he like realizes, I'm in God's presence right now. The holiness of God is surrounding me. Oh no, because he says, I'm unclean. Like I look at my life and I see sin and I see guilt and I see brokenness. Oh no, I'm, this is a problem. And so he like shouts out like, I'm ruined, I'm doomed. And then one of the angels, a messenger of God, comes to him and birthed this coal, which represents God's mercy and God's holiness coming to him, and touches Isaiah's lips and says, your sin is forgiven and your guilt is taken away. Like to say, because of the, what God, this holy God has done something for you, so that even though in your own strength, yes, you are in trouble in his presence, by his mercy and by his grace, you aren't in trouble in his presence. You are forgiven. And then right after this, the holy God says, now who will go to all the people who need to hear a message from me? And Isaiah, the one who realized I'm in the presence of a holy God who has in his mercy made a way for me to not die in his holy presence, but to live in his... And he says, I'll go. Send me. And I just don't think it was an accident. Uh, This morning, it was that passage that was on the heart of some of us as we were praying for this day. And so I want to pray for us, and then we're going to go into this, to start this new series about invitation. But I think there's something really good about realizing for Isaiah, his invitation to the world started with a revelation of God. This is who God is. This is what God does. And I'm inviting the world into it. So let's pray. Lord, um, we do, we lay our crowns down at your feet because you are holy. And Lord, let it be true of me, let it be true of us more and more so that we give our lives as an offering for you are worthy. And Lord, I pray that uh, my notes wouldn't get in your way at all. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and you take this time and just use it for your good for your glory, for our good. And that we would leave even this place like Isaiah did. Send me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so 
um, we are in this new series, Grow, and, and the, the kind of thought is around this idea of growing our family. And when you think about the church, and we've been talking about it all year, that the church is a family, that God takes strangers and gathers them together and makes a family. But really, what kind of family is it? Um, any group that you're a part of, and, and all of us are a part of different groups, they, groups are defined, groups that you become a member of are defined by what that group has in common that is distinct from the rest of the world. So if you join a, a club, it's based on you have a shared interest, perhaps. And shared interest that is distinct from the rest of the world. If you join a sports team, you have a shared maybe ability, maybe a shared school that causes you to be a team that is distinct from the rest of the world. If you join, uh, if you're a part of a union, it's because you have a shared trade. If you are a part of a political party, you have a shared, shared opinions or perspectives. And a part of a family, you have a shared name, right? And maybe shared culture or shared uh, uh, traditions together as a family. That, that being a part of a group, that group is distinct from the rest of the world. What does it have in common that makes it distinct from not being a part of that? And we're here together, and people are gathered all over the world today, gathered together in lowercase c churches like ours. And they're all a part of this capital C thing called the church. And with all the different group terms that could have been used, when Jesus describes what he wants for his people, he describes the church as a family. But not just a family in a generic sense, like, oh yeah, we have meals together and we love each other. There, there's specifics of what we have in common that makes our family distinct from the rest of the world. And so just, there's a lot we could say about it, but just as kind of a working definition for us as we move through the message today, here's what we're going to go with. The church is a family, meaning we do love one another and we're committed as brothers and sisters to each other. The church is a family of disciples of Jesus who are children of God. The church is a family of disciples of Jesus who are children of God. That one of the things that makes the family of God distinct and our family distinct is that we have a specific type of relationship with Jesus. We are disciples of Jesus. Now, that might be kind of a new term, and disciple just means, it means apprentice. So less of a student in a classroom and more like an apprentice in a workplace. That Jesus is, is leading us, is training us, is instructing us on how to live our lives the way Jesus would live our life. Right? how to live our lives like Jesus. And so we, we as, as, as a part of the church, we are disciples of Jesus. Now, sometimes we've made disciples like, it's like the varsity team of being a part of the church, but really it's not. There's, in the Bible, it was never, uh, the only kind of salvation really offered wasn't like, oh, I have a cognitive belief that Jesus existed. But salvation, life was found for those who say, hey, I want to reorient my life to begin to follow this Jesus' leadership. I want to be a disciple. I want to follow him. So we're disciples of Jesus who are children of God. We also have a specific kind of relationship with the God of the universe that is distinct. That when we put faith in Jesus, we are, the Bible says, adopted in and we become children of God and we belong to him. We are his children. And for those in the church, we are a family that has a specific relationship with Jesus where he's leading us and we're learning to become like him and a specific relationship with the God of the universe that we are his children and he loves us perfectly. And because of that, we have a security of heart that the world apart from that doesn't have. We are a family. And this kind of thing, Jesus describes it as living in the kingdom of God, which might be kind of a big, weird idea, but it's really just basically what we're saying here. That being people, we are people who live in the kingdom of God, as a part of the kingdom of God, meaning that we are the family of the king and we follow the lead of Jesus as our king. That we have a different way we live our lives as a result of that. And the vision Jesus has, if if you were to go back in time and sit with physical Jesus and say, what is your vision for the church? I think maybe the best way to grasp it is to look at a vision he gave to one of his disciples named John. 
by the Spirit, John, about, about 60 years after Jesus had died and been resurrected, John, one of the original disciples, is on an island, and God, the Spirit, gives him a vision. And when he gets a vision, here's, here's kind of the picture that he has of what is Jesus' idea of what the church is all about. And what you're going to find is it's a bigger vision than just 141 River Run Point. That's our address, by the way. All right. Um, it, it includes things like um, uh, Trinity Assembly just down the street that you could walk to. Right? And it, 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 it includes Chuliota uh, Community Church right down the street that you could walk to. And, and, and uh, uh, it, it includes um, Cross Life. And it includes right, all these different churches. And it, but it's also wider than Central Florida. Right? It includes Christians in, in Nigeria and South Africa and Vietnam. And, right? like, it includes all of that. And it's also bigger than the 21st century. That Jesus gives John a vision of what he wants to see the church become and what he will see the church become. And here's how he describes it in Revelation chapter 7. Um, and, and John has this vision and says, After this I saw a vast crowd. And this is, I see this in heaven. And he says, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes, meaning and before the Lamb, that's a way of speaking about Jesus, the sacrifice for our sins that we could be forgiven and be in relationship with God. And they, they, this huge crowd from every nation and every language, they were clothed in white robes, which in John's, in Revelation means they were washed clean of their sins before God and clothed in righteousness. And, and they held palm branches in their hands, which is, again, another weird symbol, but kind of means like they're saying, the king is here, the king is here. And they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. We have a different relationship with the God of the universe and with Jesus. And salvation comes from Him. So that's the vision that Jesus gives John to say, this is my vision for what my church will become. And you know what? We speak a language that John didn't know would ever exist. And we live in a nation that didn't exist on a land that John didn't know existed. Jesus' vision was to see everyone everywhere invited into and people from every nation and language and tribe becoming a part of this eternal family. All right, but how do we get from Jesus walking around in ancient Palestine uh, and in Galilee and Nazareth and, and, and in Samaria and Judea? And, and we get from that to this and then ultimately to this. And what we find in the Bible is that the vision of Jesus is accomplished through the commission of Jesus, a mission he gives to all of his followers. And there's a passage in Matthew 28, and we're going to spend the rest of our time in Matthew's gospel. So Matthew 28, and if you've got your guide, you can scan that and follow along there. You can follow along on the screen or get your Bibles out. Um, but there's a passage that's often called the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Sometimes people refer to it as that um, by a lot of Christians. And, and what they mean by that, and what we mean by that is that there's kind of this mission statement Jesus gives to all of his followers in order to see this ultimately happen in the world. And in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, um, this is the very end of Matthew's account of the gospel, the, the life and ministry of Jesus. And what's happened here is Jesus died, and then he's resurrected, and some of the disciples have heard, oh, he's resurrected. And so Matthew and his buddies are then instructed to go to this mountain to meet with the resurrected Jesus. And so they do that in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, that's Jesus, resurrected Jesus, they worshipped him. That's what's going to be happening in the end of the story, in Revelation as well, right? They worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Is this really, are you really alive again? Are you seeing this? James, James, James. Like, did I eat something weird? I feel like I'm seeing Jesus, but I thought he was dead, right? Some doubted, and it goes on, and Jesus comes to them and tells them, I have as resurrected Savior of the world and the King, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go 
and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, meaning even till I return again. Now, go and make disciples. This is the mission that these first disciples are given. And for the last 2,000 years, Christians have looked at this and said, oh, this is the mission Jesus gives to all of us. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them what Jesus has taught you. Now, great. But what does it mean to go and make disciples? Like, do we have a bunch of megaphones out here for you to pick up on your way out and pick a spot in Oviedo and you're going to spend the week there shouting out to the... Or is that it? I mean, maybe. Is it that, you know, being a, a, a televangelist and get, and I'm on TV right now. Hello, people on TV. All right. To kind of get yourself a nice suit and some fancy chairs and like to be on TV and preach really. Is that what it means to do this mission? Is it to invite people to an event or try to get them into a seat in a church? What, what does it mean to go and make disciples? And I think the best way often for us to think about what it should mean for us is to consider, well, what did it mean to those disciples right there that heard it from Jesus? And even this is Matthew 28, the very end of a 28-chapter book written by Matthew. What did Matthew think it meant when Jesus told him to go and make disciples? So I want to look over the, the remainder of time together back in Matthew's gospel at really Matthew's invitation that he received from Jesus and Matthew's experience of trying to invite others. And so let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9, 9 through 13. We see Matthew's original invitation to become a disciple of Jesus. In Matthew 9, it says this. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Now, that's a big deal. Like just, um, you have to imagine like uh, whatever you think about as the very notorious sinner. So maybe it's someone who's like the drunkard in the street or the most crooked lawyer you've ever met or whatever you want to come up with. That's like someone very, that you know is corrupt and is not a good person. All right, that's what Matthew is here. Matthew's sitting at his tax collector's booth and Jesus says, follow me and be my disciple. And Jesus said to him, or Jesus said to him, so Matthew got up from his tax collector's booth, seemingly to never go back again, and he followed Jesus. And the very next thing it says is that later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests. All right. So, if you said, well, Matthew, what did it mean to you when Jesus said, go and make disciples and teach them what you've learned from me? Well, Matthew would, would likely have had a hyperlink back to when he first met Jesus. And Jesus said, follow me and be my disciple. Right? Well, what did that invitation mean for Matthew? And what we see is that Matthew was invited. He recognized. He was invited into a relationship with Jesus and his disciples. And we can see this because the first thing Matthew does when he gets up to follow Jesus is go and he's got a dinner and he invites his new friends, Jesus and the rest of Jesus' disciples. So the invitation to become a disciple was an invitation into relationship with Jesus and relationship with this family. Not only that, but continuing on in the passage, it says that, you know, he invites Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests. And he has other dinner guests, all his old friends, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Which, I don't know, you ever feel like a disreputable sinner? I've been. I've, I feel like I've been there. Um, but when the Pharisees saw this, Pharisees were the religious leaders of that day, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Now, important to remember, Matthew is recounting this story. And guess who Matthew is in this passage? The scum. Scum. Now that's a translation. And what it means is, why does, they're saying, why does your teacher, Jesus, sit at the table, invite into relationship people who seem to have devoted their whole life to doing evil? 
Not just somebody who struggles off and on, but people who have devoted their life to sin. And it says then that Jesus heard what these leaders were saying and he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. And this is a quote from Hosea, the prophet. I want you to show mercy, not offer religious sacrifices. And then Jesus says this, for here's why I'm here. I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So Matthew, here's Jesus, resurrected Jesus. Say, go and make disciples. Teach people what you've learned from me. And Matthew goes back and remembers when he was first called to be a disciple and remembers, oh, I was invited into a relationship with Jesus and the family. And the invitation I received is based on mercy. Jesus' invitation is based on mercy. That scum like Caleb become disciples of Jesus and children of God. So Matthew knows this. Later on in Matthew 9, Jesus is, he's going out and Matthew and the other disciples are following him around and they're going to these crowds of people, kind of like this. And Jesus is going all over uh, that, that region around uh, ancient Israel. And, and he's, he's going out in villages and cities and fields and crowds are gathering and he's inviting them into this kingdom of being his disciples and the children of God. And it says that Jesus in Matthew 9 at the end of that chapter looks at his disciples and says, I have compassion for all these people I see because they are confused. They don't know which way to turn and they're helpless. They have exhausted all their best efforts to fix their own brokenness. So then Jesus says to his disciples, pray. Pray that God will send out more people, more messengers to bring good news to the people who are confused and helpless. And it's kind of a trick, I feel like, because Jesus says, pray that God will raise up more people to go out to invite people into the kingdom. And then immediately after that, chapter 10 of Matthew, Jesus gathers his disciples and says, it's you. <laughs> you're going to go. Good prayer. You get to answer it. All right. Thanks for praying for that. Now you're the ones who answer your own prayer. Um, and in Matthew 10, he gathers them up and he sends them out. So again, Matthew would remember the first time he was sent out by Jesus on a smaller mission just to the land of Israel, but a similar mission to what he receives at the end of the gospel. And in Matthew 10, Jesus looked at these disciples and says, go, you've prayed, now go and announce, meaning let people know that the kingdom of heaven is near. And that means it's right here at your grasp. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. All the things they'd seen Jesus do to testify that his invitation was real and true. But this is what I want us to focus on. He says, give to others as freely as you've received from me. So, Matthew, go make disciples of all nations. Teach them what you've learned from me. All right, Matthew is going to say, well, what does this mean to me? Well, when I was called as a disciple, I was not just invited to believe a statement of faith or sign a document. I wasn't invited to become a giving unit. I wasn't become, uh, invited to become a member of a club. I was invited into relationship with Jesus and this community of people following him. And when I was invited, it wasn't based on what I could do and how I dressed and what my reputation was. In fact, my reputation was the worst. I was invited based on mercy. What else would Matthew remember? Well, the first time Jesus sent us out, he made it clear that our invitation of others is also based on mercy. It's not based on whether they dress like me, whether they're educated like me, whether they talk like me, whether they got good habits or bad habits. In fact, I may very well go to disreputable sinners myself to invite them as well. And Jesus goes on here. And for the sake of time, I got a lot I'm trying to say today. So I'm going to keep moving forward. So hang on. As Jesus is, is sending them out on that first mission trip in Matthew chapter 10. 
He lets them know that as you go, even though you're inviting people based on mercy into relationship with me and you, um, not everybody's going to listen to you. Some people are going to be like, ah, stop talking about Jesus. But then he says, you know, even on your worst kind of rejection day, if you get arrested, and I don't know about you, I have yet to be arrested for talking about Jesus and my relationship with Jesus. Um, but here's what he says in chapter 10. He says, when you get arrested, which by the way, not on this mission trip, but on the later mission trip at the end, all these disciples get arrested and all of them get killed. Get killed for the message, for this message. But he says, when you're arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say, even against your greatest opponent. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it's not you who will be speaking. It'll be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Oh, that's good to know. I don't know about you. When I go to like share with here, listen, let me be honest. This is, this is easy, right? This is easier because I've been doing this for a while and I, I do feel, I, I love this and, and I feel like you love me and, and it's safe, right? But if I go to my neighbor, I go to, I get nervous. And Jesus tells them, hey, even when you face great opposition, you don't have to rely on yourself. I'll give you the words to speak. The Father is speaking through you. A little later on in chapter 10, and Jesus says, as you go, people who receive you, they're not really just saying like, oh, Caleb, I like you. They're receiving me. If they receive me, they're receiving the Father. And here's the point that Matthew learned then on his first practice mission trip. He learned that Jesus is actually making his invitation to others through us. Okay. So it's not me like trying to get people. Can I just get you to come to church with me? Come on, come to church with me. No, it's not that. Jesus, the holy and perfect Lamb of God, he is within me speaking through me because he wants my neighbors, my co-workers, my friends, the stranger, he wants them to come into relationship with him. He's making his invitation to others through us. And, and you know, there's, there's more we could say in Matthew, but for the sake of time, um, Jesus makes it clear to Matthew and, and the disciples in this first mission trip that not everybody's going to receive it. But some are. Some are going to respond to the invitation. And so what he says is, look, some are going to say yes, some are going to say no, but invite everybody. And I think there's a truth for us in this. The invitation given to others into a relationship with Jesus and relationship with us as a family, the invitation is our responsibility, no matter the response we get. The other people and, and God, they got their work to do in response to this. But inviting people into relationship with us and Jesus is not a if you want to, for the disciples of Jesus. From the very beginning, it was, do it, and I'll help you. Do it, and I'll help you. The invitation is our responsibility, no matter the response. And you know what? Even the person who doesn't who resists or when you start talking about your relationship with Jesus, they like change the subject immediately. Here's what's true though. Everyone needs the invitation Jesus gives. Everyone does. Your neighbor, your brother, your cousin, your coworker, your classmate, your spouse, your enemy, everyone needs the invitation that Jesus gives. And Matthew understood this. When he hears the commission, go make disciples of all nations, everywhere you go, he knows, oh, this is not an invitation to a club or attendance at an event. 
I'm to invite people into relationship with Jesus and with me. And everyone I meet needs the invitation Jesus gives. In Matthew 11, Jesus gives an invitation. And in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, and we're going to move to a close with this, Jesus again is standing before crowds of people and is looking at the human condition. And similar to what he said earlier, it says, Jesus looks upon these crowds and he's again moved with compassion and he says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, which is a way of saying, become my disciple. Let me teach you. Because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. When Matthew hears Jesus say, resurrected Jesus say, hey, here's your mission. Go and make disciples. Matthew has in mind what Jesus has said. This world is filled with people who are confused. They don't know which way to turn. They are helpless. They cannot solve their own brokenness of their heart. They are weary and exhausted of the way this world works apart from Jesus. They are burdened down with things they are carrying that they aren't created to be able to carry. And guess what, Matthew? You know the solution and you have experienced it. It is relationship with me through my mercy. So go and invite the others. And this rest that is promised, the reality is that no one is going to be restored simply only through an invitation to an event, simply through an invitation to a seat in a building, simply to an invitation to a party, or even an invitation to an egg hunt and hoedown, though that can be a great introduction. That is an introduction, but that's not really what the invitation is that we as River Run want to carry out to this world. We want to follow Matthew's example and the example of disciples of Jesus for the last 2,000 years, and we want to invite people into relationship with Jesus and relationship with his people. So as we come to the end in our response time, we're going to have a song in just a moment that just anchors us to this reality that we are a family because we belong to God. And we belong to, as followers of Jesus. But as we come to that time, um, we do, I just want to make sure I reference it. If you're new here, that we have kind of three ways, the practical ways to respond. Uh, we have places for communion on both sides to remember the work of Jesus for us. The way that we, the invitation to him was made possible through his death on the cross. So please receive communion on either side here. There's buckets in the back and we give an offering as a part of our worship to the Lord. Not to get anything from him, but as a grateful offering to him and saying, Lord, use this to invite others. And thirdly, at both sides will be some of the family will be over here, uh, here to pray with you. If you're carrying burdens or maybe in a specific way, feel called to respond today. But I want to, as we come to a close, challenge us in one of two ways. Maybe, maybe you have not really said yes to the invitation that Jesus gives you. Maybe you feel confused and helpless, weary and heavy burdened. And today what your next step is, is to say yes to the invitation of Jesus. Yes to the restoration he offers you. If that's you, you could do that right in your seat. But I'd encourage you, come to the family and let's pray together about that. And for others of us, including me, Maybe we said yes to that invitation, but it's been a while since we invited anyone else. What I want to challenge us to do, including me, is say, Lord, who are two or three people in my life that need the invitation you offer? 
And would you give me boldness to invite them into relationship with me and Jesus, with us and Jesus? So let's pray. Lord, as a family here at River Run, what makes us a family is what you have done for us. That we are disciples of Jesus through his mercy. And we are children of God. And Lord, for the person who has maybe never said yes or has, it sure seems like, lost track of that along the way, I pray that today you would inv- they would again feel the invitation of your love into relationship with you. And for each of us, Lord, I pray that you would press on our hearts with your heart for our neighbors and for our community. Jesus, when you look at East Orlando, your heart is moved with compassion as you see people confused, helpless, weary, and heavy burdened. And Lord, would you give us boldness to invite them into relationship with us and relationship with you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.